It's a good morning, September the 25th, 2014. This is CISG 113, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. Today is day number 10 into the fifth week of the semester. So let us get started. So good morning, welcome back to this class, CISG 113, Section 1. I know that today we have some students who would like to share, so I would definitely reserve time for you to share, okay? So, first of all, let's get back to the business of today. Now, uh, this is day number 10, and uh, the week, this week, as we can look at the schedule here, we have a themes to cover, okay? Privacy and encryptions, we briefly discussed about privacy and encryptions. And today is the time for web attacks and internet vulnerabilities. Okay, so let's go through some of the very basics here. The interesting thing about web attack, okay, and the internet vulnerability. First of all, what is meant by a web attack? Now suppose uh, you are here, you were here during the month of June. That means not even in this campus, but you know something about what's happening in Hong Kong. You remember the day on June the 22nd, okay? In Hong Kong, they have the uh, very interesting referendum voting, all right? And the voting is basically express people's idea on which particular proposals they want, okay? In Hong Kong, they're going through some kind of political reforms. And one of the interesting things is, at the University of Hong Kong, they set up a polling system to poll the uh, intentions of people to see how they Filled about the proposals uh, provided by the government or proposed by the uh, communities. And it turns out that the point stations in the first two days of try one was attacked. And it was attacked with such a proportion that it was called a national proportion. And what happened is the whole system was paralyzed. That means you cannot use it anymore. Now, if I would like to use a very simple example, now suppose you have to go to the Buddha environment every day to get updated, and all of a sudden you discover that you try to log into the Buddha environment, it takes you hours and hours and hours before you can even log into the system. Now, the system did not say it's not going to log you in, but it's taken infinitely long to log you in. So you are basically deny the service of getting into the systems. Okay, that is an example of web attack. The system was paralyzed by some kind of software or people's intentions. So, web attack. Now, the web attack is basically made possible because intellect, when it is being want as a system, definitely has some kind of vulnerabilities. What is meant by vulnerabilities? Vulnerability could be simply interpreted as weaknesses. Okay, weaknesses of the system allow the hackers to make the best use of such weaknesses to attack the system. So, what we need to do in, in the context of uh, this course, uh, we cannot teach you how to do all of these, we can't. Basically, you cannot learn all of this. And even a course like this would not let you try this out because it's true detrimental. So, in the context of this course, we'll be trying to help you to understand something closer to this, we try to give you some concept, all right? So the concept is given from the perspective of ethical hacking. Ethical hacking means when you do something which was supposed to be bad, but when you add the adjective ethical in front of that, you are telling people that I'm doing this bad thing for some good purpose, all right? So ethical hacking means there are hackers in the world who have turned into a good guy from what they did before and they use the experience to help you protect the system. Well, later on, we're going to see some very interesting video on this. But first of all, let's try to do some cold <laughs> lecture. Okay, what is meant by cold lecture? Okay, let's see, here we got it.
First off, defining the concept of ethical hacking. Ethical hacking at its core is using the techniques and tools, the approaches, the attacks that an attacker would use to identify vulnerabilities, document the vulnerabilities, and plan remediation. Many times, folks that aren't as familiar with security penetration tests or security analysis just assume that all security experts, especially IT security experts, are the same, that they use the same techniques, the same tools. They assume an auditor is the same as an analyst. They assume an ethical hacker uses the same tools as those folks as well. And that's simply not the case. Ethical hacking is different in this core function in that it uses the exact same methodology, the exact same tools that a hacker would use. Someone outside frequently the company, someone out of control of the company, to actually understand the network, penetrate, compromise, but do it in a way that's ethical, meaning that they document this, that they record the steps, they record the breaches, they record the parameters that they've used so that later on analysts and auditors can come and look at those results and determine what things may need to be done in the future to help prevent similar attacks but from an unethical hacker down the road. This is a key difference. This key approach difference is really what separates this from anything else out there. When we talk about ethical hacking as well, one thing to remember is that ethical hackers follow specific rules and guidelines, and these are really, really important. The core rules of ethical hacking, first and foremost, do no harm. Do not destroy assets. Do not wreck networks. Do not deny service and, in, and actually affect real use of systems. Do not lock people out in a way that's not part of the plan. So doing no harm is really the big distinction between a cracker and an ethical hacker. A cracker or a true attacker, as part of their attack, may want to do harm, whether it's compromise sensitive data, deny service to legitimate users, destroy assets, and so forth. Ethical hacking differs there in that, typically, there's no destruction and no harm done. Ethical hacking is also really rooted in boundaries, understanding what systems can and cannot be attacked. For example, an online database that's critical to customer data or critical to transactions, that kind of database should never be attacked by an ethical hacker unless it's part of the ethical hacker's boundaries, unless that database is specifically included. Most businesses that are being run 24 hours, seven days, most businesses will not want an ethical hacker to approach any critical business systems because it could simply impact business. So understanding what those boundaries are up front and then honoring those boundaries is absolutely critical. Countermeasures are not part of the ethical hacking process. As you're examining networks and footprinting and determining vulnerabilities and installing compromises, that process doesn't include at every stage, well, I wonder how I would defend against this. That's not part of ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is getting in, finding the vulnerabilities, documenting as you go, certainly, but countermeasures are usually considered only after an entire ethical hacking process is complete. After you're successful, after you've compromised vulnerabilities, after you've actually owned the network, so to speak, that's when you worry about, I wonder how this company, my company, any company, could protect against this. That's when that research happens. Sometimes it's a natural outcropping of the attack itself, and that's great. Document that, but do not focus on countermeasures during ethical hacking. All of this should be in agreement, written agreement, with whoever is the subject of this ethical hacking process. If you're a consultant and you've been brought in to determine vulnerabilities and risk exposure for a company, getting agreement on what are the critical systems, what are the boundaries, what are the targets, what are the areas of concern is really important and it has to be done in advance. It can't be done during the process. You can't stumble across customer database number 72 and raise your hand and ask, is it okay if I hack this database? That's not the proper approach to ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is an understanding these systems are off limits. 
those systems are in bounds. These systems are the systems that we're most concerned about, or the data over here is the, ones we're, is the data we're most concerned about. And documentation is absolutely critical. I recommend that you thoroughly document every step, every process, every keystroke you make, frequently using things like Camtasia to record video or getting screenshots, having a notebook where you jot down notes as you're doing things, commands you run, data you get, and so forth. Saving all of that in a special place on your hard drive or on the network, having a nice backup of it, that's absolutely crucial as well both to ensure that you capture everything, every part of the attack, all of the compromises, success and failure and so forth, and also for personal liability reasons to ensure that you show exactly what you did do and exactly what you did not do. So one more. Now, the idea of web attacks and internet vulnerability, we start out our lessons by learning the contents of Africa and hacking. Okay, so the descriptions in the soft video give us two important terms, and I hope you have already caught it. One is the cracker. The cracker is the bad guy. The bad guy is going to destroy everything without telling you in advance. They have no concern of who you are, what is important for you. They are here to destroy, to get what they want, the cracker. And then here comes the hacker. Hacker could be described as the bad guy, the good guy, or someone in between. But when we add the adjective ethical in front of the term hacker, he is going to become someone good. Okay? He's doing something for the purpose of discovering the weaknesses in the system. So that he is going to document the process to tell the owner, the system, where it is going to be attacked easily. Okay? So the ethical hacker is also a very experienced person who has the capability to crack a system. But he's going to crack the system for the purpose of protecting it so that it's not going to be attacked or cracked it easily. In the context of web attack, you know that a lot of the websites will be attacked by hackers. And the example I gave at the beginning of the class in this past June in Hong Kong for the system which was hosted at the University of Hong Kong. It was cracked at the very beginning. Cracked in such a way that it suffered something called a denial of service attack. Okay, a denial of service attack is basically a DOS attack. So here we are, we would like to introduce to you a little bit more on what is meant by a DOS attack. The line of service attack is basically to keep the system busy. Busy in such a way that the system will not be able to entertain any user. Okay, you are the legitimate user, but the hacker is able to generate a lot of user requests which come from the pseudo user. So, when a lot of the pseudo users requests come into the system, the system do not distinguish which one is which. You are in between, so the pseudo user comes catching a term all the time, and you are always waiting behind, and you wait, you wait, you wait until you become frustrated. So what is a delay of service attack? This is a very famous web attack you need to know, okay? Listen carefully. Contrary to a lot of folks' perception, a denial of service attack isn't about cracking security. Is it about getting to see secret data or getting to change secret records or things like that? It's actually really, truly denial of service. Actually mounting an attack that stops legitimate users from accessing intended or legitimate services. So for example, an email denial of service attack isn't about trying to see other people's email. It's more about preventing legitimate users from checking their own email or sending and receiving email to and from legitimate users. And it's done by sending an exorbitantly large number of legitimate looking requests for that kind of service or to that service or server 
in a way that the server or service can't really distinguish between valid and not valid requests, overwhelming the system to a point where it just can't handle the capacity anymore and either shuts down or becomes unusably slow. That's really all the denial of service attack is, just shouting and yelling and screaming, but in computer terms, to actually stop things from happening that are supposed to happen. In a simplistic case, this is kind of a real simple example, but it works for all denial of service attacks. In this example, a hacker finds the target, in this case, Big Money Bank, and finds that there's a router on the front side of Big Money Bank that's connected to the internet. The hacker, during their footprinting of it, determines what kind of router, what it might be susceptible to, and then sends a large amount of traffic to it a whole bunch of spoofed packets, a whole bunch of legitimate looking stuff, tons and tons and tons of information to that router until the router simply can't handle all of the traffic and crashes or performance gets low, something like that. Some bad thing happens because the hacker is simply overwhelming the router with this traffic in such a way that the router can't distinguish between legitimate and non-legitimate traffic. The router can't figure out, am I supposed to discard these packets or not? Or even if it can try to figure out whether certain packets are legitimate and should be serviced or not, it can't do that fast enough. It can't actually keep up with the flood of traffic or the incoming information. So if it can service it, maybe it can't service it very quickly and connections time out. For legitimate users, it means that legitimate users can't get in or super slow stuff is happening. That's fantastic. That's the intention of a denial of service attack. And as you can see, it's a pretty simple, straightforward attack. There are a number of limitations on a denial of service attack. Primarily, almost any device that's connected to the internet today can typically predict or, or pick up these patterns of, wow, I see one client just flooding me with traffic over and over and over again. For example, the router might look at the attack and say, I see normal traffic coming from all the other clients that are hitting me, except one client over here is just sending me 100,000 times more traffic than anyone else. And that is something that routers, switches, DMZ hosts, bastion hosts pick up pretty quickly and either send up a flag so an administrator takes a look and hopefully prevents or stops the attack, or the device itself may resist the attack. It may shut down for a little bit and then bring itself back up, or it may block that IP source or subnet. It may actually do some active defense on its own, but at the very minimum, it's going to alert administrators, and the administrators can come and actually do something. Another important limitation is if you've only got one attacker mounting a denial of service against a single host or against a bunch of hosts, there's only so much traffic that that individual or small set of systems can actually pump out. One internet connection can only handle so much. It's actually quite a bit of a limitation if you think about it. It only really scales up to a certain point and most internet services, most routers, switches, DMZ hosts, web servers, and so forth can resist really easily one host worth of traffic, no matter how hard they're trying. So really, the scale is the problem. And there's a way to overcome that scale. So you hit the target, right? Now, you know something about a DOS attack, the denial of service attack at this point, and as this guy has the purpose to understood, if it is coming from one source, the power of a denial of service attack is limited. Okay? And most of the router can actually handle this. And then how come that it could um, terrorize the system uh, at the University of Hong Kong in June? Because it's not just a denial of service attack, it's something called distributed denial of service attack. That means it's more than one source. Okay? When it's coming from more than one source, it's going to be very, very fatal. So what we are going to do is trying to give you a sense of this immediate attack. So now let's take a look at... Uh, we, we're talking about uh, attack is definitely not that's a good thing. But we would like to see 
if you're gonna make sense of web based attack, they do have its benefits. So what kind of benefit is this? Alright? See if you can catch their idea. There are a few benefits to consider when deciding whether to conduct some web-based attacks. I think the biggest one is that an attacker can attack from anywhere in the world. A web-based attack works equally well from across the city, across the street, within a network in fact, and across the world. So that level of abstraction allows an attacker to oftentimes remain undetected, certainly unidentified, and not arrested or thrown in jail for what they're doing, for these kinds of attacks. As an ethical hacker, it helps because it proves the point of not knowing who an attacker is. When a company finds an intrusion and wants to trace it back, it's really, really, really difficult to do. And this type of attack, web-based attacks, hits that point home by showing that even if it's coming from inside the network or really close by, it doesn't matter. It's super easy to cover tracks. Another key point is that an attacker can build one set of skills and use it against a multitude of servers, a multitude of organizations, companies, platforms, and so forth, because these skills are very easily transferable. They're not unique to a specific version of an operating system with a specific patch level and a specific type of exploit. Web-based attacks are just really, really good universal skills, so a lot of attackers do understand this space very well and are able to attack in this space really easily. It also scales well, considering the fact that this attack approach can be very universal. It means that this attacker can attack hundreds of servers, thousands of servers, instead of one server or two servers. Footprinting is certainly still an important aspect. Footprinting the systems to ensure that the attacker knows what operating system they're running, what version of the internet server they're running, and so forth is critical, sure. But an attacker can attempt a thousand different attacks at the same time against a thousand different servers if they understand some core web-based attacks and know how to scale them out so that they can try them that fast. The other aspect to remember here is that there's only so many web server types. The attacker builds their skills based on usually the most prevalent web servers at the time, and I'll show you which ones they are in just a moment. An attacker that has any kind of skill at compromising those primarily used web servers is going to find a lot of success out there. There are any number of web-based vulnerabilities out there. We're going to examine several during this video, but there are other videos in the Certified Ethical Hacker series that actually explore these in a lot more depth. For example, there's an entire video on SQL injection attacks out there that you can take a look at. But this point here on this slide is just to show that there are not just one or two types of attacks. A lot of folks think, well, there's just attacks against web clients, installing an extra toolbar or a browser add-on, something like that. That's really the only type of attack. That's actually not true at all. There's a number of web-based vulnerabilities, server-side, client-side, and both server and client-side combinations that can be exploited by an ethical hacker. You're going to see an awful lot of those in this video, but you will see them across the rest of the videos as well. And I mentioned that there's a fairly limited set of web servers out there, and that's a little bit of a misnomer, in that there's primarily two web servers out there. Microsoft's Internet Information Service, which comes on Windows Server, and Apache, which typically comes on Linux. And those two combined account for more than 75% of all existing web servers at, the, at this time. That doesn't mean that there's only one or two more. There actually are quite a number of different web platforms out there. But there's two primary web platforms in broad use today. So as an attacker, these are the two that you want to concentrate on understanding a little bit more, understanding the vulnerability space for, and how to exploit them. IIS and Apache are both nice for an attacker in that you can run them in virtual machines, you can download them, uh, reconfigure them, play with them, and actually do practice attacks against them. And they're not unachievable. They don't run on giant platforms that cost trillions of dollars. 
they don't run in unique scenarios. These are pretty much commodity platforms. So after watching this video, you know that basically hackers must be familiar with the two major types of servers, the web server before they can mount an attack on this, and these are based on the window, the IIS, and the Linux, the Apache. And also one of the benefits, as you can, just, you can hear the saying, that of launching a web-based attack is your identity can be hidden and not easily discovered. <coughs> but the interesting thing about the June attack in the University of Hong Kong in two days, or within one week of the attack, you know what happened? They, they asked for help from one of the very famous um, ethical hacking company in the United States called Cloudfair. And Cloudfair said, they look at the situations and they said, let's help. And then they won the kind of defense for the University of Hong Kong system and they resisted the the tremendous attack by those hackers with the proportions which is considered as World War number three. Okay? And they mapped the mapping of where in the world the attack was initiated. And they mapped it in such a way that actually of course the group. And whatever it comes up to attack the system of Hong Kong Cloudflare, set up a defense system. And then at the end of the day, they published the picture of how they managed the attack. And when the picture was published, we can see it's just like launching missile. You know what is a missile? A missile is basically a, a bomb which can fly from one continent to another continent, and bomb it over there. And it's, it, it, it's unimaginable to look at the, the magnitude of this kind of attack. And then something very interesting happened. The trains attack. And you know what? They traced that, that most of the attack come from the Ch from China companies. Okay? And even come from inside China. They call it the, the Red Gauntlet Attack. You see what happened? That's basically a war between China and the United States in terms of cyber attack. Don't you see? Have, have you heard this story? Okay, you can easily find informations. Uh, <clears throat> let me see if I can immediately search something for you. Look at that. It, you can easily find out something more. Hong Kong group battles huge distributed distributed denial of service attack the next web. Okay, let's just pick this one, okay? And then the democracy movement hit by one. <coughs> this is the story you need to read. Okay? Cloudfair, Hong Kong democracy movement hit by one of the largest DDoS attack in internet history. Okay, and then here's the story, here's the story, uh, this is the guy here who owns Trophy. look at this number, 300 gigabits per second plus attack right now, this is a, on nine records of how this company fought for this democracy uh, 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 web attack, uh, is a, very interesting story. You look at it, you look at it. And I, I'm sure if you continue reading something like this, you're so much amazed by what we have gone through in Hong Kong. All right? So let's go back here. Okay. Great. Now I have just given you some hints on understanding uh, web attack and internet vulnerabilities, and definitely there are many, many more videos here you can study. But <clears throat> in order to help you put things into perspective, in this course I do not mean to clump you with all this kind of so-called knowledge in the area of information security and privacy. I want you to make the best use of your knowledge to make the best use of them. And how can we help you with that? The key is reflective learning, okay? 
prefect of learning is also the reasons why you are invited to write a personal blog at the end of your learning contract. So let's go through it. Two minutes. Self-regulated learning. 
Self-regulated learning, as I explained it to you in our Monday class, required you to focus on four important areas of class management. All right. The first thing is do not set goals of your learning. So how do you set goals? You look back to the requirements of what you need to produce for the second learning contract. The set of artifacts very similar to the first learning contract. But when you look deeper, in the second learning contract, you need to form a team by combining two pairs. Have you found your team, team pair yet? Okay, you need to produce your team pair's information by tomorrow, not later by, not later uh, than next Monday. Okay, that means you must produce that. Then you will be given a team space to start all your work. Now, when you look at the artifacts to be submitted in the second learning contract, it's very similar to the first learning contract, except that in the report, which again contains two topics, each topic is now contributed by one pair rather than an individual in the pair. So the two topics in your team report should contain one topic from one pair and you have two pairs in your team, okay? And that means you need to <coughs> negotiate with your team pair partner which topic you want to use as the basis to write your team report. And again, <coughs> if you look at carefully on the second learning contract, we also would like you to take a look at the course intended learning outcomes. Do you remember where you can find the course intended learning outcomes? You can find it from your syllabus, okay? Which part of the syllabus? Part D, okay? The last part of the syllabus in outcome-based teaching and learning detail. You can also find it from the course support website. How many course intended learning outcomes are there? Six, okay? And most of the course intended learning outcome started with the action verb described, okay? So it's not going to be too difficult, all right? So, very importantly, you need to know the time you have. In the second learning contract, you have three weeks instead of four weeks, okay? In the first learning contract, when you submit your work last week, it's because you already spent four weeks time doing it. And it's only in the last week we're going to collect your work. Now, in the second learning contract, you still have three weeks time instead of four. So we're going to collect your work on in the week of October 11, okay? So make the best use of this three weeks. Then, in terms of the four important areas of task management, besides setting goals, besides selecting a topic, besides negotiating with your team or peer partner, what do you need to do? You know the timeline now, the three weeks time, you need to come up with an action plan. How are you, how are you going to ensure that you will not do things at the very last minute. Remember project information literacy we introduced you about two weeks ago. You start out looking up information and if you do not do it in time, that means if you procrastinate, you will end up getting frustrated. Now if you do not want to end up getting frustrated, you need to come up with strategies. What is meant by strategies? appropriate method to position your time and manpower to get the job done. What is that job done is the goal of your learning. So that is very important in terms of housekeeping work. Now that is a very important thing, your action steps that you need to map out. And how are you going to do that? You must have good discussions with your peer partner and between the two peers in your team. So in class, normally I would give you five to 10 minutes time to go together to talk something about this. Now, I'm going to give you five to 10 minutes time now, okay? Now, before that, let me give you the other two areas. You need to identify resources. You need to come up with an action plan. You need to evaluate the results of your action plans before the deadline comes up and you need to revise your action plans. Okay, you need to set goals, you need to know your time, you need to identify resources, you need to act on the steps, you need to evaluate the result, and you need to revise the plan, okay? So, now I'm giving you five to 10 minutes time to eat something, 
to go to talk to your peer partner and to look for your teen peer partner and then uh, come back to the discussion forum, express something to your here after watching today's video and the introductions I provide to you. All right, feel free to move around uh, and I'm going to do attendance call through, okay? Let's go for today. Helia, uh, thank you. Claudia, yeah. Ada, thank you. Andy, learn, thank you. Uh, Ryan, Vaughn, thank you. Jenny, you, thank you. Jackie Wong, thank you. White Ping, thank you. Remember correctly, out of 40 persons in this class, we have 21 students, yes, who fill out the questionnaire. And if you look at the questionnaire, in terms of the number of disagree and agree, it's pretty um, what we call uh, long for this class. So, um, you look at the first questions, we have uh, 18 to 3 in terms of agree and disagree. The second questions we have again, 18 to three. Uh, the third questions we have four, and then we have um, 17 to four. 
and then disagree one to twenty, I guess. And then you you can take a look at things like this, and you can feel um, for as a teacher, I need this information to see if we in the right track, which is compatible to most of the student in class. But um, you see, we are borderline. We just half. We oh, got the information from half of the students, 52.5%. So for me, I still need to look up more information, particularly from your work, to see if it is consistent with the predictions of this class. Uh, Lovely, for um, individual students who express different uh, particular viewpoints, we cherish it very carefully. We count the response, we look at the comments, and when I look at most of the comments, it's very positive. Now, one, uh, one theme that comes up consistently, uh, it's very interesting. I look at these questions. This is a very important question to look at. When I ask how many hours have you actually spent in completing your learning contract? Now, first of all, you know that it is expected you spend six hours per week in order to get the basic learning activity of this course done, okay? So in the past four weeks, principally speaking, you should have spent 24 hours. Because six hours per week with four weeks, you should have spent 24 hours. Now all this 24 hours, it does not mean all the 24 hours are needed to produce the artifacts. Because when you look at the amount of artifact, these artifacts could only be classified as an artifact for only one week, okay? So if you look at it from this angle, if you're really skillful, Six hours should be enough for you to generate the artifacts in the first learning contract. Okay? Six hours. But if you're serious about your study, these six hours of work must be embedded in the context of the 24 hours of practice. That means if you really want to develop the ability of OIA, but you have actually not spent 24 hours doing all these necessary activity, you're just producing a piece of homework that is described in the passive learners category. You're producing homework, this is one way to deal with the course. This does not mean you know how to manage the course in such a way to learn, that means to develop your ability. So when you look at things like this, um, I would say first six to eight hours, this is the category of managing the course, not enjoying and developing your ability yet. Six, more than 12 hours is an indicator that this posture is willing to spend time in developing ability. Four hours, this is a superman. Okay, I have no idea. This is another super superman. One hour is excellent. Right? This is the this is the guy who definitely knows how to do it course, but he or she may not know how to develop ability. Ten hours, eleven hours, two to three hours, nine hours. So report. This guy is excellent. He may not understand the question at all. Okay? More than 15 hours, uh, four days, it used to be the, the procrastinator. It means I used to last four days to get it done. So it's so excellent. More than 24 hours. So from the way that you answer this, and also you can look at this. How much time per week have you spent completing your learning contract? Five persons say less than two hours. Seven persons say from two to four hours. Three say from four to six hours. Six persons said more than six hours. So from this, I would say, wow. Um, actually, I'm looking for more in this category and more in this category. Okay? So out of 21, only nine persons are in this category. So what does it mean? Either you do not take the course seriously, or I need to do something to adapt your style of learning. Because a lot of you will consider that assignment is an assignment. They will not consider that. It's through the process of generating the assignment, you will actually get to engage in the developing your abilities to do it. So, but it's okay, because a lot of you still need to learn the way to look at questions like this. And when I ask, have you measured the amount of time you spent completing this learning contract? 14 persons said yes, 7 persons said no. Okay? So when that said, how, how is this 7 persons going to give you a number of hours that you can expect to be reliable? There is a question. 
Because I should say, here I should obtain 17, or 14 only, but I have 21. So is it sincere answers or what? So you have to understand this is the way to look at it. And when you look at data like this, all right, there is very, which item below have become print and submit for learning contract number one? Okay, so look at that. Principally speaking, I should expect all, because you need to submit all, right? Uh, but it's okay, because there's one way to get your ideas, of course, and as a teacher, I need to look at it very carefully. And then, uh, this is the example of the information obtained for the specific topic, okay? For the specific topic. Do you understand what I expect from this answer? Yes, I'm actually I'm expecting either this one or this one, okay? It's a question you can directly copy from the information there. And most of you got it. Um, I think it's uh, very interesting to look at this, the way you handle this questions. And you look at the IBL. This is very fascinating. When we look at the how you interpret IBL. Now, I would like you to spend time reading other students' interpretations of this first study contract. Well, IBL is talk about learning by yourself. And IBL is not teach you learn something. It's guiding you how to learn by yourself and you need to find out some information what you need. And choose which information can help you. That is hard to choose. So you will read carefully, then you can learn more. Alright? This is very interesting. What is meant by IBL? IBL means after handling my work, I still do not know what have I done. <laughs> This is IBL. IBL is to be done through experiences, and for us, our experiences are gained from doing researches and report. When I'm doing my learning contract, I'm able to create questions about a topic that is closer to what is expected, to find information to solve my questions, to search more data outside of the reading list, and to connect my own experiences and thinking towards the topic. Okay. I would say this is very much closer to what we expect after you have done the first learning contract. Okay? So IBL is such as online forum. And then IBL is based on the independence of the student. Very interesting. And the core learning activities in IBL are all about we find a topic which we're interested in and we start to find the information we need. Very, co very much consistent with what we expect and try to understand and interpret the points and think critically, okay? IBL, it is convenience, right? So, it helps us to know about the, the running of doing a report or homework in the university. For me, IBL is willing to ask, learn by ourselves, I'm involved in the topic, and then so much by searching information, analyze data, and having peer discussion, very good, by sharing what I've learned and the opinion or review by the popular. You, the, the core learning activity is use some videos and you are model to learn what is information security and privacy. Meeting my peer in, in, fr in Friday 10 and researching internet when I'm back to the college. I think IBR is a good learning style and habit, such as I want to finish my assignment, I need to find information from many ways, I can watch video and search on the wiki, this action is done by Mark yourself, you encounter the problem and you will solve by yourself, I think this is behavior, maybe inquiry-based learning, okay? And then this inquiry-based learning is student-centered method of teaching mathematics! Wow, so it employs different core, core structures, including some group work, projects, and courses that are not very improved base. Wow, this is, this is someone. In LC001, we have a pair of discussion group work, writing journals, and report as project. So you see that there are, these are what we expect in terms of the students' comments. And I think core activity is to let me know how to manage my time to do those reports and then how to cooperate with my partners also, we can learn how to analyze the information. What is meant by IBL? I don't know. 
We have to search the information by ourselves, it trains us the ability to learn. What is meant by IBM? How to reading by yourself and organize what you what to, what you learn from a topic. I don't like IBM at all. I don't think IBM is effective. Okay, good. Very French thing. All right. This is an example of passive learning. This is very important. It is quite hard to start writing a journal suddenly. Suddenly, well, it becomes a habit to write every week for me. LCC is one very improves my writing skill, and I can know more about my team. Okay, this is a result of IBL, right? I have seen many websites about information technology and how to protect our own information. To make our learning more creative, like we need to propose the extra questions about what we learn. Investigate and construct new knowledge. I think generate new questions and discuss and reflect on discoveries. But a core learning activity in IBL, I have experienced. This is quite, this is quite nice. Wow. This is quite nice. So what do you like most? <clears throat> Honestly, I'm not very adept to this design. Maybe this is my first year. Because we also have teachers who teach and carry us in high school. So I need to adapt this design. This is very true transition. Because I said something here. Okay. <laughs> anyway, you're not, you're not compelled to say. All the reading materials are provided in the Buddha so that I can check the information more, much more easily, such as public online forums, so a lot of people like it, right? I like interactions on the online discussion forum during class and join so much. A lot of interesting videos make me easy to understand. It's easy to control. I like the sharing presentations that can improve what I learned from the past lecture and develop myself to share and practice. I like the professor, wow, because you, you have a biscuit to eat today. You said you have Buddha to let me learn more information security and privacy. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see. I like most about we can choose what we want to learn in this GE course. All of these courses I like. The most one I think is I can watch video to learn knowledge. Okay, the videos on cars. I think Moodle is very convenient because we can know all the information about the course from this web page. Nothing. Okay, thank you. I have to do all the stuff by myself. It gives me the motivation to work. Wow, this is, must be a very hardworking student. All about this course. Thank you. Wow. I know what is information security and privacy. I like the relaxing atmosphere in class because this class is not too boring rather than other classes. Wow, that's good. Okay. I like to watch the funny videos about the GE course. Um, in this GE course, I know it's very busy, but maybe I can learn better. Actually, I don't like this GE course because there are many assignments to do. You're very honest. But on the other hand, I can know more about the computer knowledge from the assignment before I haven't learned it before. Okay, that's good. That's very good. Okay, what do you think needs to change in the design and context of this course? I think this design and content also have positive and negative. At this time, I don't suggest change anything. Just go on. Instruction is not clear, surely. My instruction is not clear. To reduce the amount of assignments, since we also have assignments from other subjects. Very true, very true. But do we have a lot to do? No more. Okay. It's kind of too much. The time of class is no good. Nothing on the design. But I hope the guidelines of the assignment can have more detail. Well, okay. Let me see if I can give you more detail. Sometimes we are not really understand the meaning which got by Dr. Rath from the video. I think we need more explications. Okay, then, typically speaking in Chinese, as we call it, four qin yu zhang, four tong hong zhang, four hao wang zhang. That means the videos is always there, you can watch them as many times as you want and you can come to ask me. I hope that it can add more interactive courses and communicate your students. Okay, interactive courses. Maybe there is a lot of repeat information that you have put on the first page. And that ourselves confused. Repeat, okay. So we need to be much more concise, all right? I have no idea about this. Separate the homework into each week instead of all in the fourth week. We, we do not have homework every week. We just, we just want you to do it, spread it out using as much time as you can and submit it during the time, okay? All right. I tell you what, if I separate it every week, people will say, You have a lot of work to do every week! Alright, so, I think GE course 
should not have too much homework. Yes. We don't have homework. We just want you to do something. Or and submit something towards the end. Yeah. As I said, the very if we don't have homework, but you have to demonstrate how you got it, right? Too much video to watch. <laughs> Students that still don't understand after watching those videos. Watch them again. <laughs> no, I think they didn't go to change. Could you please leave less assignments? <laughs> As I said, no assignments, contracts. You need to demonstrate you know something. Assignments are not the purpose of this course. No more than the assignment left from my compulsory course. I'm sorry, because most of the compulsory course, the teacher do not give a lot of assignments. No, yes. I think they are not the professional faces using this course, which is hard to understand without searching information online. Yes, we want you to look at intonations. I think we can have less submissions. Oh, three is okay. One and then two extend the semester. All right. Give us more information about the course. I hope the assignment do not keep together because it's very really, very really hard for me. Sorry. Okay. That means. Oh, let me tell you that we do not mean to ask you to submit all the thing in the form with. Maybe I spread it. So uh, maybe in the secondary country you can start submitting assignment from next week. Okay. To the end of the period then. Then you feel comfortable. All right. All right. Decrease the amount of assignment. All right. Um, as I said, the way the assignment of the acquired learning activity designs are uh, mainly developed from your basic ability to collect information. All right. So, oh, I'm sorry. You need to, to tell us something today. We have students who would like to share. I'm sorry. Yeah. Come. Uh, let me see. We need to go to week number four. Is it Helia? Helia and Ryan, right? Ryan is going to tell us something about... Yes, please come. Please come. Helia. And then Ryan will tell us something about the Facebook, I remember. Okay, Helia. Uh, Ryan, go first. Okay. Yes. I do not want to take away your score. <laughs> Anybody who would like to share? Thank you, right? You see, I, I, I need to talk less. Make sure you have time for you. So now we have Ryan. Hello? Hello? Hi everybody, today I'm going to show you how to use our Facebook privacy setting. Okay, do you... Setting! <laughs> okay, um, do you know what we should do first? Uh, absolutely not in my Facebook account. Okay, this is a uh, fake account because I don't want to show my Facebook account in the course. Okay. Huh? Yeah. Ah, can you see this icon? Yes. This is a um, private setting. Ah, setting. Right. Okay, when we click on the button, we can see a uh, free button. First is who can see my uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, timeline or maybe. Okay, when you click on this button, uh, we can see a uh, who can see my uh, post. Uh, okay, you can set your fans or public. Public is mean all people can see your Facebook post. Okay, you can use this setting to. Set your mm, privacy setting. Okay, maybe uh, you want everybody see your post, and when you post, I uh, post something, post something in your Facebook timeline. But in this time, you don't want everybody to see your uh, your post. What should we do? We can click and 
choice who you want to uh, who see your maybe you want your just your fans see your host. Okay, you can choose your fans and host. Okay, that is very easy to use. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay, it's, just, it's not a weird kind of thing. Yeah, so say. Now, we thank you very much, Ryan, for pointing this very important um, icon for us to pick to control the privacy. Now let's pass the time to Helia. Yeah. Hey, good morning everyone. Today my sharing topic is information literacy. What is information literacy is a uh, ability to search what you want from the internet. And the first step is to go on search what is, what data you want. So we can go for searching reliable data from our school library website. We can see the results here and we can click on database and we can find so much academic uh, resources. And the other one I recommend for you is the Google score. When you click on this website, you can search something uh, in sentence, not only keywords. I think it's very useful for us. You can go to this website and search what you want. This or uh, maybe book. Uh, maybe some academic uh, researchers you can find and use on your paper. Uh, yes, we can tap on sentence and we can find some keywords here and you can watch we, what we can get. And after we have some data, we have to evaluate what we want and what we have, what we can put on our paper, right? So after we evaluate and analyzing, we have the most thing, most important thing to do is citation. We have to respect our original author that everyone can know uh, this is not your own idea, it's from others. So we have, uh, this is also the website I recommended for you because it's a generator that called citation generator. It can have APA style, MLA style, or another uh, style from other university. Maybe you can use this one. After doing this, uh, maybe your uh, research are perfectly done. So that's all for my this Thank you very much. You have a very good control for time. Thank you, Javier. I strongly recommend our student to take the very good opportunity in class to earn some class participation score because it is going to be very useful to you towards the end of the semester. Now, I think we are going to stop here. We have five minutes past 11.15. And I'm going to see you again next Monday. And please, each pair is going to mark on Dr. Bet's uh, Q&A hotline for this week with number five, your team pairs of donations, okay, before next Monday, all right? So that I can start grouping you together and you have to do it together by working out with your secondary contract. So, so much for today. Uh, lift the biscuits on your table for the sake of the next class, okay? And I, I have to go to my vehicle to bring us some more. So I have three class today. So that's it for today, CISG 113, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy on day number 10. Until next week, stay in tune.